Book 12, Chapter 3 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicola K. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3 by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston, Book 12. Chapter 3. How the kings of Asia honored the nation of the Jews, and made them citizens of those cities which they built. The Jews also obtained honors from the kings of Asia when they became their auxiliaries, for Seleucus Nicator made them citizens in those cities which he built in Asia and in the lower Syria, and in the metropolis itself, Antioch, and gave them privileges equal to those of the Macedonians and Greeks, who were the inhabitants, insomuch that these privileges continue to this very day, an argument for which you have in this, that whereas the Jews do not make use of oil prepared by foreigners, they receive a certain sum of money from the proper officers belonging to their exercises as the value of that oil which money, when the people of Antioch would have deprived them of in the last war, Musianus, who was then president of Syria, preserved it to them. And when the people of Alexandria and of Antioch did after that, at the time that Vespasian and Titus his son governed the habitable earth, pray that these privileges of citizens might be taken away, they did not obtain their request in which behavior any one may discern the equity and generosity of the romans especially of vespasian and titus who although they had been at a great deal of pains in the war against the jews and were exasperated against them because they did not deliver up their weapons to them but continued the war to the very last yet did not they take away any of their forementioned privileges belonging to them as citizens but restrained their anger and overcame the prayers of the Alexandrians and Antiochians, who were a very powerful people, insomuch that they did not yield to them, neither out of their favor to these people, nor out of their old grudge at those whose wicked opposition they had subdued in the war. Nor would they alter any of the ancient favors granted to the Jews, but said that those who had borne arms against them and fought them had suffered punishment already, and that it was not just to deprive those that had not offended of the privileges they enjoyed. We also know that Marcus Agrippa was of the like disposition toward the Jews. For when the people of Ionia were very angry at them, and besought Agrippa that they, and they only, might have those privileges of citizens which Antiochus, the grandson of Seleucus, who by the Greeks was called the God, had bestowed on them, and desired that, if the Jews were to be joint partakers with them, they might be obliged to worship the gods they themselves worshipped. But when these matters were brought to the trial, the Jews prevailed, and obtained leave to make use of their own customs, and this under the patronage of Nicolaus of Damascus, for Agrippa gave sentence that he could not innovate. And if any one hath a mind to know this matter accurately, let him peruse the hundred and twenty-third and hundred and twenty-fourth books of the history of this Nicolaus. Now as to this determination of Agrippa, it is not so much to be admired, for at that time our nation had not made war against the Romans, but one may well be astonished at the generosity of Vespasian and Titus, that after so great wars and contests which they had from us, they should use such moderation. But I will now return to that part of my history whence I made the present digression. Now it happened that in the reign of Antiochus the Great, who ruled over all Asia, that the Jews, as well as the inhabitants of Celesyria, suffered greatly, and their land was sorely harassed. For while he was at war with Ptolemy Philopater, and with his son who was called Epiphanes, it fell out that these nations were equally sufferers, both when he was beaten and when he beat the others, so that they were very like to a ship in a storm, 
which is tossed by the waves on both sides and just thus were they in their situation in the middle between antiochus's prosperity and its change to adversity but at length when antiochus had beaten ptolemy he seized upon judea and when philopater was dead his son sent out a great army under scopus the general of his forces against the inhabitants of celesyria who took many of their cities and in particular our nation which when he fell upon them went over to him yet was it not long afterward when antiochus overcame scopus in a battle fought at the fountains of jordan and destroyed a great part of his army but afterward when antiochus subdued those cities of celesyria which scopus had gotten into his possession and samaria with them the jews of their own accord went over to him and received him into the city jerusalem and gave plentiful provision to all his army and to his elephants and readily assisted him when he besieged the garrison which was in the citadel of jerusalem wherefore antiochus thought it but just to requite the jews diligence and zeal in his service so he wrote to the generals of his armies and to his friends and gave testimony to the good behavior of the jews towards him and informed them what rewards he had resolved to bestow on them for that their behavior i will set down presently the epistles themselves which he wrote to the generals concerning them but will first produce the testimony of polybius of megalopolis for thus does he speak in the sixteenth book of his history now scopus the general of ptolemy's army went in haste to the superior parts of the country and in the winter time overthrew the nation of the jews he also saith in the same book that when scopus was conquered by antiochus antiochus received batania and samaria and abila and gadara and that a while afterwards there came into him those jews that inhabited near that temple which was called jerusalem concerning which although i have more to say and particularly concerning the presence of god about that temple yet do I put off that history till another opportunity. This it is which Polybius relates. But we will return to the series of the history when we have first produced the epistles of King Antiochus. King Antiochus to Ptolemy sendeth greeting. Since the Jews, upon our first entrance on their country, demonstrated their friendship towards us, and when we came to their city Jerusalem, received us in a splendid manner, and came to meet us with their senate, and gave abundance of provisions to our soldiers and to the elephants, and joined with us in ejecting the garrison of the Egyptians that were in the citadel, we have thought fit to reward them, and to retrieve the condition of their city, which hath been greatly depopulated by such accidents as have befallen its inhabitants and to bring those that have been scattered abroad back to the city and in the first place we have determined on account of their piety towards god to bestow on them as a pension for their sacrifices of animals that are fit for sacrifice for wine and oil and frankincense the value of twenty thousand pieces of silver and six sacred artibrae of fine flour with one thousand four hundred and sixty medimni of wheat and three hundred and seventy-five medimni of salt and these payments i would have fully paid them as i have sent orders to you i would also have the work about the temple finished and the cloisters and if there be anything else that ought to be rebuilt and for the materials of wood let it be brought them out of Judea itself, and out of the other countries, and out of Lebanus tax-free. And the same I would have observed as to those other materials which will be necessary, in order to render the temple more glorious. And let all of that nation live according to the laws of their own country, and let the senate and the priests and the scribes of the temple and the sacred singers be discharged from poll money and the crown tax and other taxes also and that the city may the sooner recover its inhabitants i grant a discharge from taxes for three years to its present inhabitants and to such as shall come to it until the month hyperheritus 
we also discharge them for the future from a third part of their taxes, that the losses they have sustained may be repaired, and all those citizens that have been carried away and are become slaves, we grant them and their children their freedom, and give order that their substance be restored to them. And these were the contents of this epistle. He also published a decree through all his kingdom in honor of the temple, which contained what follows. It shall be lawful for no foreigner to come within the limits of the temple round about, which thing is forbidden also to the Jews, unless to those who, according to their own custom, have purified themselves, nor let any flesh of horses or of mules or of asses be brought into the city, whether they be wild or tame, nor that of leopards or foxes or hares and in general that of any animal which is forbidden for the Jews to eat, nor let their skins be brought into it, nor let any such animal be bred up in the city. Let them only be permitted to use the sacrifices derived from their forefathers, with which they have been obliged to make acceptable atonements to God. And he that transgresseth any of these orders, let him pay to the priests three thousand drachmae of silver, Moreover, this Antiochus bear testimony to our piety and fidelity in an epistle of his, written when he was informed of a sedition in Phrygia and Lydia, at which time he was in the superior provinces, wherein he commanded Zenxus, the general of his forces and his most intimate friend, to send some of our nation out of Babylon into Phrygia. The epistle was this. King Antiochus to Zeuxis, his father, sendeth greeting. If you are in health, it is well. I also am in health, having been informed that a sedition is arisen in Lydia and Phrygia. I thought that matter required great care, and upon advising with my friends what was fit to be done, it hath been thought proper to remove two thousand families of Jews, with their effects, out of Mesopotamia and Babylon unto the castles and places that lie most convenient. For I am persuaded that they will be well-disposed guardians of our possessions, because of their piety towards God, and because I know that my predecessors have borne witness to them that they are faithful, and with alacrity do what they are desired to do. I will, therefore, though it be a laborious work, that thou remove these Jews under a promise that they shall be permitted to use their own laws. And when thou shalt have brought them to the places forementioned, thou shalt give every one of their families a place for building their houses, and a portion of the land for their husbandry, and for the plantation of their vines. And thou shalt discharge them from paying taxes of the fruits of the earth for ten years. And let them have a proper quantity of wheat for the maintenance of their servants, until they receive bread corn out of the earth. Also let a sufficient share be given to such as minister to them in the necessaries of life, that by enjoying the effects of our humanity they may show themselves the more willing and ready about our affairs. Take care, likewise, of that nation, as far as thou art able, that they may not have any disturbance given them by any one. Now these testimonials which I have produced are sufficient to declare the friendship that Antiochus the Great bare to the Jews. End of Book 12, Chapter 3 Recording by Nicola Cave